Welcome everyone. My name is Burkan Shkur. I'm a professor at Oregon State University. My uh, co-investigator here is Jason Wise, again from Oregon State University. Uh, these are the people who actually did the work. We are presenting on their behalf pretty much. And I want to disclose that we are not structural engineers. I know this is a structural engineering audience, uh, except for Wahid. We are not structural engineers. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit different presentation, but at the end of the day, I think we have a very common, we have a common understanding where we want to go as the industry. ACI has this vision as well. We want to make concrete sustainable. And one of the biggest ways that we can make concrete sustainable is reduce the cement use or, uh, and also uh, reduce the clinker content of the cement that we use. Uh, and at the same time, make our structures last longer, live longer. And there are two parts of those two legs of this promise. One is uh, uh, creating uh, mixtures that are based on performance. You specify a performance and you try to achieve those with your uh, uh, material. And the other one is that for the structures that are already built, we want to predict their service life so that we can actually take mitigating actions, repair, re rehabilitation actions. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the service life modeling aspect uh, most of the time. Now the challenge that we have is that the industry is going toward uh, using uh, very different mixtures, especially when we, kind of, when we use performance-based mixtures, we can be very creative about these things. Now, we all know using conventional supplementary cement materials like fly ash and slag, these are pretty common, but the industry is going towards underutilized SCMs, off-spec ashes, for example, coal ashes, uh, other types of uh, ashes like bottom ashes, reclaimed ashes, agricultural ashes, and other industrial and natural byproducts like uh, pumice and some natural clays. Uh, we're also using limestone uh, more prominently. We're extending the use of limestone and we use the uh, limestone synergistic effects with some uh, uh, certain SCMs. So the systems that we are currently uh, you, uh, envisioning that the concrete is going to look like uh, are uh, very different than what we have been doing. Uh, so, um, what does that mean? Well, we have to understand how these systems will perform, obviously, and also uh, how these uh, systems will uh, react when external agents come into contact with these structures. So, uh, as I said, this presentation is going to be on service life modeling. And when I say service life modeling, what I say is actually uh, looking at uh, the interaction of external agents with the uh, reinforced concrete structure. Now that can be uh, like the icing chemicals, it can be uh, marine uh, salts, uh, it could be sulfates, and many different uh, exposure environments uh, can cause problems for our structures. And all of them have a, a common denominator, which is basically some kind of a, a deterioration species, uh, like an ionic species or a multiple uh, versions of those, like multiple ionic species, have to go into concrete and uh, go through some reactions and deteriorate the concrete. So we are very interested in that process. And those are highlighted here. Transport of ionic species in concrete is a major problem. There are multiple mechanisms. This can occur. Diffusion, electrical migration, chemical activity, addiction. We're not going to go into those things. But at the end of the day, none of these could happen if you don't have moisture in the system. So moisture transport is part of this problem. When you're dealing with moisture transport, you also have to deal with heat transfer. So this problem is rather complex. Today, we're going to just focus on this ionic transport part, ignore the moisture transport, heat transport part. And we're going to uh, basically, uh, uh, I'm going to show you an equation that actually can mathematically model these systems. I don't want you to focus on the equation. That's not the point. I just have to put something here. So it's basically that different mechanisms of ionic transport can be modeled through uh, uh, equations. This will take the form of a differential equation at the end of the day. So you solve this differential equation using numerical tools like finite element method or finite difference method, and you get your uh, ionic uh, species profile between your concrete as a function of time. Now, there are some highlighted uh, points there. These are basically the things that are uh, the parameters that you need to know before you can solve this uh, problem using a numerical technique. Now, for example, one is porosity. You need to know the porosity of your uh, concrete. You need to know your, for example, diffusion coefficients of the ionic species in that specific concrete. And you also need to know what kind of reactions 
those ionic species would have with the existing system. Now, currently what we do is, or I should say, traditionally what we do is, we use empirical approaches, we do testing to basically identify those things. Now, as I said, we are going to a different paradigm. We are now using many, many different materials with very variable uh, properties. So it is impossible to actually test every single material that you're envisioning to use in your structures. So we have to go away from this approach of empirically approaching everything that we need for solving these problems. And also empirical approaches also are error prone, time consuming is expensive. So what we are thinking is here, what we are doing is what we call self-sufficient modeling is to determine those properties to theoretical uh, relationships. So, and once you can do that, you can actually use time marching algorithms of finite element or finite difference method and couple your uh, reactive processes with your uh, transport processes that I just showed you, and you can actually solve these uh, time dependent uh, uh, ingress problems. So how do we go from this empirical approach to self-sufficient approach is where I want to talk a little bit. At, at the bottom of this is basically the ability to model reactions. So can we model reactions on the fly at, e at the time marching steps of your transport problem, for example. For example, if you're running a 50-year bridge simulation, let's say you want to model the chloride ingress in a bridge, it's a simple example. Uh, you want to also know uh, what those chlorides are going to do when is they're going into, because some of the chlorides will be bound by the chemicals inside your concrete. They're going to be uh, immobilized by others. So you have to know these reactions. So how we approach reactions is basically through a process called Gibbs energy minimization. And I'm going to just very simply demonstrate what that means. So if you know what your, if you think about a closed box, and that closed box you put in some chemicals. And in this case, let's say we put a thousand grams of ordinary Portland cement and mix it with 400 grams of uh, water. We know what that composition is. We can do chemical analysis of OPC. We know what those are. And we say that when you mix those things, you're going to produce some products. You're going to produce calcium silicate hydride. It's a good part of your concrete. You're going to produce some calcium hydroxide. It gives you high pH. And there are different phases. But you don't know how much of those phases would form. So Gibbs free energy minimization say that, OK, let's say these are the amounts for those each phase. You can calculate using a thermodynamic database what the total free energy or Gibbs free energy of the system is. Let's say that's that cross. Now, if you change that estimate, let's say you say instead of 500 grams of CSH, you say you can 550 grams of CSH and others are adjusted accordingly, you may get a lower uh, Gibbs free energy, and that is thermodynamically a more stable uh, state than the previous one. So if you keep repeating this, at the end of the day, uh, after many iterations, you can find the lowest energy state of the system that will give you the reactions or the uh, equilibrium state of your uh, system. So this is what we use in our uh, modeling uh, framework. Uh, so we can actually uh, uh, take any ordinary Portland cement, mix it with any type of supplementary cementitious material with any mixture proportions, and then we can uh, predict the performance uh, or we can, using this uh, thermodynamic modeling approach, we can calculate what will be output of those systems. Now, uh, those outputs can be, uh, are in terms of the actual quantities of the products that you form in the uh, uh, matrix, but also pores information, like we can determine uh, uh, capillary porosity, we can determine gel por porosity, chemical shrinkage. We can also determine the composition of the pore solution that you have in your concrete, and we can take all those things uh, uh, one step maybe be before that. One thing we also do is uh, to understand, for example, for a given SCM, what percentage of the SCM is actually reactive. So we have these pozzolanic reactivity tests that can actually tell us, let's say for a given SCM, how much of that SCM will be reacting. And we also uh, can determine uh, how those SCMs will react over time. So we can say at 28 days, these are the reactions that will happen. At 56 days, these are the reactions that will happen. And at, let's say, one year, these are the reactions that will happen. So by doing this, we can actually uh, you know, predict uh, the reactive transport processes uh, in concrete.
Now, uh, this is a, a, a well-validated framework. I know this audience probably is not very familiar with this, but this has been uh, developing over the last 10, 15 years. It's a very well-validated framework. We are able to model these reactive transport processes in concrete rather well. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we do is take the, uh, for example, uh, information that we obtained use thermodynamic modeling and extrapolate them to concrete. For example, you can actually have aggregates in the system. What do aggregates do to your concrete in terms of transport property, in terms of porosity? We can also, in, in terms of strength even, uh, we can predict these things without doing experiments. And these are extremely useful. Uh, this is a plot where we show, for example, experimentally measured porosity versus our uh, predicted porosity for concrete mortar or paste. Uh, this is a, 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 a plot that shows our way of uh, predicting uh, transport properties. Uh, we show really good uh, correlation between experimental and predicted values. And at the end of the day, once we have those properties predicted theoretically, now we can solve these differential equations uh, without the need of empirical data for any system uh, as a function of time. And we can also model reactions of these systems as the aggressive species are going through your concrete. Uh, as I said, it's a very highly validated system. This, uh, these plots show, for example, uh, chlorides as they are uh, traveling through concrete. These are chloride binding isotherms predicted by this approach. Experimentally, they match really well. We also uh, benchmark these systems with other highly uh, um, well-developed uh, reactive transport models that are used in other fields, not in civil engineering, but for example, geo-environmental fields or nuclear engineering fields and they also uh, uh, work well. Uh, I had a validation example here, but I'm going to skip that and just go to the conclusions to give you some time to ask questions. Basically, at the end of the day, what we are saying is that we can use this uh, modeling approach uh, to model reactive processes as well as thermodynamic, as well as transport uh, processes. Uh, and that coupled uh, process is the key to predict service life from a durability point of view uh, for uh, these reinforced concrete structures. For bridges, which is the uh, focus of this session, this has implications, obviously. If you can model, for example, chloride ingress properly, if you can model uh, carbonation properly, you can model coupled chlor uh, chloride ingress and carbonation process pro uh, properly, you can actually now uh, have a better understanding of uh, corrosion-induced in uh, uh, problems, corrosion-induced damage, and you can take it from there in structural predictions whether structure is going to have the necessary necessary load carrying capacities or serviceability requirements. So uh, this is basically uh, where we are going with this. And uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions if you have any. Then this is our beautiful campus. Uh, looking forward to seeing you if you happen to be in Oregon. Yes.